welcome, Noah. And I think other other folks on the call so far, they, they've maybe been on other um, webinars in this in-depth series, but this is really meant to build the knowledge base of our community at Open Team in a way that fosters coherence and collaboration so that we can better serve our diverse membership. Um, so we really hope through these number of presentations to illustrate and document the dynamic nature of our community in support of strengthening and expanding it. And we also hope to inspire and share new concepts and technologies, which I think you'll really hear today um, that enable the emergence of new collaborations and, and tech approaches. Um, so each presentation uh, today included will last about an hour with about 45 minutes, give or take, uh, for a presentation and 15 minutes for questions. And we'll close at the top of the hour. Um, and so now, Gregory, I'll give it to you to introduce Noah. Awesome. Um, thanks, Laura. Well, welcome, everybody. And welcome to those who will be watching the YouTube later. Um, so th you could think of this as one of sort of in the category of um, social coordination and funding and um, decision-making around pub open source software and public goods. Um, and um, I had the pleasure of running across uh, Comakery and then getting to meet Noah in the context of the um, Open Climate Collabathon that we're also gonna be doing some both in, in depth on and as a community participating in. And from there, Noah and I have been having, along with other folks, uh, Will, Dorn, Laura, and other folks in the ecosystem, a series of really interesting conversations um, about centered around Comakery, which is a really exciting platform to be able to coordinate on um, complex um, projects where you have distributed teams working towards some sort of shared goal. And um, that, I think, is a uh, a strong intersection with what we're doing at Open Team, which, you know, trying to manage complexity, trying to manage different teams, prioritization, decision making, all of these things, it turns out there's sort of a, a pattern language or a pattern that many people around the world are um, evolving approaches to. And I really consider Noah to be at the nexus of innovation in this. And he has, ha he has context from different people and different groups and different patterns as he's evolved Comakery. So I'm super excited to just get a little bit of insight into what he's been learning and how that has transferred into the design and implementation of Comakery um, as a platform. So I'm really excited for, for this. So thank you, Noah, for taking the time to do a little bit of presentation and question and answer, and just really excited about this intersection between Comakery and Open Team. So take it from there. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Gregory, and for Laura for the introduction. And um, I'm going to, uh, let me just uh, get set up here. I'll share my screen. Um, da, da, da. So. Okay, so um, I'm going to, I'm going to do sort of two there's gonna be two threads. One, I'm just gonna start out by showing you what the platform is right now. And then I'm gonna dig into the background of how we got here and sort of all the, the sort of uh, uh, where we've gone and, and the different philosophical underpinnings that, that sort of informed, informed the decisions we made. Um, so let's start here. So um, I just a little bit about myself first. Um, what I, uh, I've done a lot of things. I've been in the sort of uh, software development world for the last 20 years, mostly on Agile teams and such. Notably, I ended up at uh, NASDAQ for a while, building up their private market and shares posts and sort of thinking through the equity side of things. I also co-founded a company called uh, Citizen Code, which was a holocratic consulting shop. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and I've done a lot of programming, um, I, I don't know, 20 or 30,000 hours of programming. And I've spent a lot of time with blockchains and um, sort of have been, was uh, obsessed about sort of the responsive work movement and, and these kinds of things. Um, so I'm gonna launch straight into the demo. Um, just wanna make sure that, is Zoom still tracking my, my screen? <laughs> 
Yep, looks okay. good. Okay, great. Uh, perfect. So um, uh, at the on the front of the site, you'll see that um, we have this idea of uh, missions and featured missions. Um, the Open Climate Collabathon is is one of these. Um, we're also doing some work on toolkits for P2P economy. This is with uh, sort of the extended um, Holochain community um, and have done some uh, more of academic work, um, you know, with uh, Stanford's blockchain group and such. But the, at the high level, these are each different missions. And then when we drill into them, um, we have a set of uh, projects that roll up underneath uh, each of these missions. So we'll get into how this how this idea evolved uh, a little bit later. Um, we tried a few other things, but this this is uh, this is one has stuck around. Um, so under this mission, um, there are a lot of different uh, different projects. This one has tons of projects, and each of these has a uh, number of people that are interested. And right now, the missions are are sorted by interest. You can see. The folks here, I'm heavily involved in the in the collabathon, so you can see me here, and also uh, Martino. I think maybe talking too too soon. Um, and then you can you can click through and see, you know, people's GitHub repo, these sort of light profiles. Um, and no, okay. So go ahead, someone. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to uh, just drill straight down to the project level because I think this is where most of the most of the detail is. Um, I put together this <clears throat> sort of demo project, um, and so on the project landing page, um, it's possible to have a video um, that describes the project um, there, and then there's a set of tasks, and there's the team and. Um, at the top, there's a bunch of links. Um, one of the challenges I would say towards building these um, collaboration systems that also include incentives and such is that it's really easy to boil the ocean. And uh, to some extent, we've been we've been guilty of that, and we've uh, we've been around since 2016, so or actually 2015. So we've had uh, plenty of time to try to boil the ocean. And um, just just prior to Comakery being built, um, there was another a number of other projects. One of them was called uh, Assembly Made. Um, and I talked to, to Matt and uh, I was like, he, he sh ended up shutting down that business. And he was like, I was like, what, sh what should I not do? And he said, don't boil the ocean. So uh, we, we continued and boiled the ocean. We weren't going to build a project management system. That was like our mantra for a while. And then we built one. And now we're kind of like thinking about how to evolve that and to uh, basically integrate as many other tools as possible. Um, so I'll, sh I'll talk about those, those links to other systems in a little bit, but um, at, at a high level there, uh, each project has a number of settings and I'll just go into the settings here. So you can associate your project with a mission. Um, there's a title, a description, this has some markdown in it. You can use markdown there. Um, set up the images. These are links to other important things. And then um, this is, uh, somewhat unique or not, I wouldn't say unique, but it's a little bit rare in project systems that we actually have the tokeniz tokenization built in. And that's been a core part of the platform since the beginning. So this is just uh, using a, a testnet token. Um, some of you may have used called Xenus. And um, then there's some questions about connecting to Slack channels and Discord channels and things like that, where you can have notifications for when awards are, um, awards are sent out. Um, there's some visibility settings. And then um, the next probably most important piece to show you is task page. So there's, um, this is uh, essentially this, the different statuses uh, that are, are present in a Kanban board. So for community tasks, you can see that these are ready. Um, you can, then there are ones in various stages, started, submitted, accepted, paid, rejected. Um, and those can be managed. Um, you can also manage these on the My Task side. Um, to create these, I'm just going to show you. Oh, that's the batch settings. Sorry, I can create a new task. So I think one thing that's different about um, community project management than, um, than maybe more closed team project management is that. There are probably more repeating tasks and there's a sense of parallelization 
instead of there's like choices and parallelization as opposed to a more definitive sequence that you might see in an agile project management board. Um, so in support of that, there are, there's this idea of task repetition here and also how many tasks, have, how, how many times a task can be done by a, a particular user. Um, and then maybe the, when the task times out, so that can be extended as well. Acceptance requirements and things like that. So this is somewhere between um, something like, uh, you know, like Pivotal Tracker and um, GitHub uh, and sorry, and, and Gitcoin bounties. So um, you can associate an amount that's uh, paid for this task and you also can repeat this uh, many times if it's an easier one or more, a more clear one. Um, so that's this and da, da, da. Uh, yeah. Then there's the, the transfers page, and this is actually the, the payments piece. Um, and you can see, uh, in this case, we have uh, a Ethereum testnet token. There's, um, this one is not paid yet. So if I click pay on this, it will actually pop open my MetaMask wallet. And I can do the payment. Uh, there are, there are, um, there's API endpoints also so that you can have a hot wallet. For instance, if there were a lot of these, if you were, if you were scaling to a very large team of hundreds or thousands of people doing bounties, you also can uh, have a, a hot wallet that pulls down transactions from uh, the API and then, uh, then processes them. Uh, and uh, it's also probably worth noting right now, even though this, this goes out to the um, Ethereum Robson uh, testnet, that uh, we've templatized the ability to add different blockchains. Uh, so there's like a generator for adding new chains. Um, so that's that page. Oh yeah, this, this also has, um, you know, when there's also on this side, uh, which is the um, transfer side, it is possible to categorize each of these, um, each of these token types, um, sorry, each of these, these transfers by their type, and then you get this uh, reporting that, that shows up. So you can manage the, the types for transactions and things like that. So you can generate new, new transfer types. Um, this is important um, because uh, the system is also meant to be able to um, connect into crowdfunding uh, platforms. Uh, this is why there's like an earned and bought. And um, there also is a a full AML KYC system that's built in for plugging into, into regulated crowdfunding. So that's a little bit more visible on the, um, on the accounts page where you, you actually see AML KYC here, which is <laughs> it's not difficult to see AML KYC on most project management systems. Uh, so that's this piece, there's accounts. Um, Just to, uh, yep. for those who don't know, um, that's anti-money laundering, know your customer mm. laws in order to make sure that if you're incentivizing something, the people who are being incentivized aren't terrorists, et cetera. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, I uh, sort of jumped uh, jumped to mains, but yeah, this um, there's a few things that you might check on the on the crowdfunding side, particularly if the token is classified as a security, and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards towards the end. Um, but there's uh, basically there's a bunch of transfer restriction. Um, there's some uh, smart contracts with transfer restrictions that this platform also plugs into. So you can do things like maximum number of tokens that someone can hold. Are they a, someone who has a lot of money or are they somebody who is an ordinary investor? There's all that kind of stuff that's also built in. Um, accounts, transfers. Yeah, so then there's an, a number of other convenience links, I would say, which are things that we we don't build, but that we uh, we want to make links to because this is a you know project hub, video conference link, uh, governance. Um, this can link out to something like um, you know a DAO. Uh, this one's I'm just linking over to the Alchemy one for DAO stack. Uh, this presumably could also be Lumio if it's um, if if it's a maybe less blockchain oriented community. Uh, and then. Uh, link out to GitHub repository and documentation. There's, you can add an onboarding link. And, uh, and then also uh, a link to funding. So say to something like Open Collective 
Um, it could also be to quadratic funding for this project, et cetera. Uh, and the, the goal, and this is kind of uh, back to the boiling the ocean <laughs> problem, is to integrate these things so there's more connectivity between, say, governance and um, GitHub pull requests and things like that. So in this example over here, uh, just a hint about where this is going, um, we have things like pull request review and small pull request review. Um, and the where this is headed next is to be able to create um, uh, um, webhooks so that these can get triggered by uh, activities that are occurring on other platforms and they can just get embedded into other systems. So that's that's where things are headed. And close these guys out. Any any questions up till now? I'm probably going to jump into the into sort of where this all came from part <laughs> shortly. One question I would have yeah. um, would be, you were just saying that they would connect into other other sites. What what other sites would those be or other? Yeah, so um, I would say um, the, the ones that keep coming up are mostly around either communication or around uh, software development. So um, GitHub, GitLab, um, uh, and then also uh, message boards and things like that. So you, if you have um, community managers or people that are uh, in, engaged in um, building the community that there's some uh, sense of how engaged they are. And that also uh, generates is part of the, the award system. Um, so, so for instance, Discord, I think I'm saying the right thing, uh, Discourse, yes. So for instance, Discord has a whole badge system. And so uh, webhooks around Discourse would be another, another kind of great example. Um, gotcha. And then, you know, the, the other part is that like, um, in, in some cases where Comakery is, is sitting is as a sort of administrative tool and isn't so much customer facing, in which case um, folks are integrating directly into the API, but then writing a completely different website uh, on the front end. So in our, in our work with Republic, we're taking more of that approach where the back end is more of the token administration system and they have bounties for people to do things on their site, but it, it um, connects to the Comakery API, uh, and then they're also managing uh, the back end for their investor flow and, and things like that as well. So it's more of like a uh, administrative engine rather than um, uh, people directly landing on these project pages. Cool. Um, duh, duh, so yeah, maybe let's jump into the, the history of where this came from or the, the background. Um, so how do we get here? Uh, <laughs> So in 2015, um, I was a partner at a consulting shop that was running as a, as a canonical holacracy. Um, we were experimenting with self-organization. Um, we all had an agile software development background and uh, we're doing a lot of lean product development. Um, we, uh, we, we decided to run as a canonical holacracy um, so that we could learn from that system as opposed to doing this sort of light make it up kind of version. And the intent was to generate something of our own at the end of that process um, that, that fit us as a community. And um, the things that we discovered we really wanted were easier onboarding for new people that were joining our company. We were, you know, we were an LLC as opposed to say uh, a community. So uh, we were looking for, you know, onboarding for, for new hires. And then um, we wanted something that was more specific about budgeting. So, uh, and, and we also wanted to allow for token, tokenization of LLC profit interests. None of these at the time were, I would say Holacracy was very hard to onboard people onto. Um, the, uh, it said nothing about budgeting and it didn't, even though Holacracy One had a pretty sophisticated LLC agreement around how they were giving people equity and things, it wasn't actually part of the, of the main holacracy system. That was there as a reference, but it wasn't really embedded. Um, and what was interesting to me, and I'll, I'll just sort of, um, sort of, what was very interesting to me was that within holacracy, the power over who pays other people ends up being 
the implicit power in the organization in my, in my view. So without talking about budgeting, the, you can't really talk about, uh, you can't really talk about distributing power effectively, I don't think. So out of this, um, this is right around the same time that um, uh, Vitalik made his post on DAOs, DACs, DAs, and more. And um, it, it's interesting going back and rereading this article because somehow the, the definition of what a DAO is, is actually what a do is. So the, you know, if you think about what a traditional, what, what's happening where people aggregate money together and they do this voting, um, I think in the article, he, he act, it would be interesting to go ask him, but it's in the article, it seems like he actually categorizes um, the, these investment DAOs more as dues and that Ethereum and Bitcoin are actually more, more the original idea of the DAO. Um, so that, that's fascinating. Anyway, at this time we were um, really, I was very influenced by this and got involved on, mostly on the, in the Ethereum community. Um, and so the first version I would call like decentralized autonomous organizations less than or equal to 1.0. And um, we were sort of also contemplating this question of like, well, what is a firm? Um, you know, some other organizations were going a slightly different direction where they had an open community and they were spinning up these small services. Um, and uh, um, uh, in spiral definitely comes to mind here. So we were learning from them as well. There's this question of like, why start these companies at all? Um, what causes people to, to create a firm. And um, I think, you know, sort of looking at, at like the, the Coase, uh, Ronald Coase, who's a, a Nobel Prize winner, looking at his analysis of what the factors are that cause people to create a firm and sort of more traditional economic um, analysis. He's basically looking at these different kinds of transaction costs, which are like the discovery of collaborators, um, in our case, with an aligned purpose, values and, sk and the appropriate skills. Um, how do you actually make sense of things? How do you make decisions together? How do you bargain for personal collective compensation? And how are you going to enforce the rules and values? And each of those things has a different cost. And uh, the reason why people traditionally have created firms is in order to push these costs down. There may be other reasons, but that's definitely a, the economic analysis of it. And so the, the sort of hypothesis is, you know, that a decentralized association would preferred if the coordination costs are lower and the individual benefits are higher than a centralized firm. So this sort of gets into the, um, the question of like what, what actually leads to being able to drop those costs versus um, uh, having them increase. And um, I, I think one, one of the challenges in this, uh, in this field is that, um, you know, we, I feel like, in a hierarchy, what we're trying to do is, is um, use the hierarchical structure of the organization to drop the cost of coordination. And that is, you know, from uh, an analytical perspective is that you're getting this, you know, log value of the total number of people in the organization to, to, um, to the cost is, is, is a logarithmic function. Um, and what we're trying to get to, like the ideal, the sort of pure decentralized version is everything is like a single person operation or, you know, in, in computer science it'd be like, oh, one. But what we end up with often when we take away the hierarchy is everyone trying to coordinate with everybody else. And then we're basically getting, uh, you know, the square of the number of participants, which is worse than both of the, both of those two other options. So the, the question I think is how do we end up dividing up the work um, and dropping the cost um, and ending up with high quality decisions and high velocity of, of quality decisions. And um, it, you know, obviously it turns out to be a very hard problem. Um, so uh, er earlier on, we were looking at the pioneers of self-organization, um, you know, going all the way back to say cybernetics, uh, uh, looking at sociocracy, which happened in the sixties and seventies um, has this sort of consent idea. Uh, Visa's work, um, DHOC, chaotic organizations, a number of other sort of modern companies, Valve, Morningstar, GitHub, and Spiral. And then we use Holacracy and of course uh, also Pirate Party Swarm, swarm, uh, swarm organizing tactics are pretty interesting as well. Um, I feel like every deck and coordination isn't complete without mentioning <laughs> Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, but I, I think, um, Many people have heard the various principles that are um, 
that are helpful for organ for a self managing um, community um, and uh, that has some common pool of resources. And the uh, I would say that uh, so so at a high level, what Ostrom ends up putting forward is that. Um, the tragedy of the commons or everybody coming in doing whatever they want and just grabbing the resources can actually be cheaper to monitor at the local level than it is from an external, um, uh, an external monitoring agency. And so uh, she does the game theoretic work for that. I think a lot of, a, a lot of um, sort of descriptions of her work list these principles out, but in her book, uh, Governing the Commons, she actually goes through the, the game theory of how the cost of local enforcement can be lower than uh, the cost of enforcement from say an external government agency. But I think what, what people also generally miss is that she very clearly says that there are, there are membranes around, around these groups and that there needs to be clearly defined uh, boundaries and there are some set of graduated sanctions for, for breaking rules within the group. I think um, some people emphasize that a little bit less. Um, and I think it's sort of important to look at the whole and also recognize that the work that she was doing uh, did, include, uh, did include some uh, game theoretic models and, and um, we, should, we should reference those. So uh, the, the other thing, the other sort of like I'm sort of aggregating all the ideas that were informing me at the time that, that the first version of Kumakri came out. Um, so the other thing I was just thinking about at that time was these two different games. Um, one is called Prisoner's Dilemma, the other is called Stag Hunt. And the Prisoner's Dilemma game, basically uh, the idea is that um, there's, there's a, uh, two, uh, two different prisoners in separate cells. They've been part of the same crime uh, and it's whether or not they're gonna tell on the other prisoner and their punishment will be, um, th their, their, their punishment will, the best outcome for them is if they betray the other person, uh, but they're not betrayed by the other person. Um, and so this ends up being like this defection game um, where uh, you, can, you can think of it as like, the opposite of a collaborative environment. <laughs> this is this is where people are driven apart by the the game dynamics. The more interesting game, or the the game I think to um, move people towards in collaborative groups is more around you know you can just say uh, better together, or you're able to 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 achieve better things together by um, going after the same the same goal. And uh, there's a, a game called Stag Hunt, which is do you hunt hares separately, um, or do you team up to um, to hunt one uh, one larger game and get a bigger payoff together? So that's um, on the game theory side. There's definitely way, obviously there's way more sophisticated game theory stuff, and you guys all may be a part of it if you if you worked on blockchain protocols or th thought through some of this. So I'm sure this you know for for some of you this may be simple, and for others this may be new. Uh, and then, you know, there's this uh, other word which gets turned around, which is emergence. And I would just <laughs> like to say there's two kinds of, there's two kinds of natural emergence. The thing on the left, which is amplifying emergent collaboration, you know, fish. And there's the thing on the right, which is like emergent disasters. And um, I, I think, you know, maybe early on, uh, there was, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of coordination, I think, you know, 2015 through 2017, where it was this idea that, you know, if you free people up to do what they want and they have roughly the same mission that it's all gonna come together. And I would argue that often you just end up with a hurricane. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it is a good thing to, to think through these things. All right, so here was the first version of, of uh, Comakery. This was back in, in 2015. We had a Slack bot, um, there were proposals. This, uh, this is sort of the, an example of what the Slack conversation would look like. Uh, we had uh, crypto equity that was distributed as Bitcoin colored coins, and we were getting lined up to do revenue distributions just before Ethereum launched. And uh, you, you could vote on, uh, there was like an, an in-team voting um, proposal system. Uh, and then there were compensation based on different kinds of awards. And um, it was, uh, it was an interesting idea. And 
this this actually was kind of the first version of Comacri. Right after this, the whole the whole DAO thing happened, and uh, we sort of rethought whether unincorporated associations could <laughs> are suitable for for holding equity and sort of because they don't have any lim limited liability, and they also um, you know all the things that happened with the with ICOs and the, and the SEC. Because of my background at um, uh, you know at, at various private markets, I pretty much knew what was going to happen on the on the SEC side, and so I was very I was actually very cautious during during 2016 2017 around around crowdfunding, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what the best uh, sort of legal approach was, uh, and and you know as, as you all know, it's pretty challenging on the legal side. Um, so early self-organizing learnings, everyone loves flexibility and autonomy. Um, lots of people hate governance meetings. I think this was like <laughs> one of the big learnings from Holacracy was like that, uh, that people really did want to get involved tactically, but there was almost like an allergy to governance meetings of restructuring the, the you know, what we moved to was that everybody could modify the structure of the company through GitHub pull requests. And we had a constitution. And um, in order to do that, you would we went through the, the sort of holacracy like proposal process of processing tensions and things. And um, generally, people really dislike those meetings, um, except for you know maybe people that were really involved in like promoting them, such as myself. I found them really interesting, but generally, um, there was a lot of it led to a decent amount of apathy, and it, there wasn't the level of engagement that I was. Um, that I was hoping for, and I, I think people weren't so satisfied with that. So that was another thing. Um, also, you know, with these consensus processes, uh, or I should say, consent process, which is that nobody objects to the thing that's going to happen. Um, if if you don't, if if you haven't experienced it, um, holacracy rules are essentially that you can propose something. Um, you have to have a reason to propose it because there's some tension that you're addressing. You propose it, and then um, there are some clarifying questions, responses, and then people can object uh, to that proposal, but only on the grounds that it would cause harm to the organization or it would take the organization backwards. So there is some uh, there's some unblocking mechanism then. But if if it is established that one person in that circle uh, wants to block, um, that you need to repropose uh, su such that it uh, it addresses their their concern. Um, it's it's fairly powerful. It is possible to be to end up with a complete block, uh, un, unlike a, a voting system. But it is not the same thing as consensus because if you don't have to have everybody agree, you just have to have not have any hard disagreements. So that was pretty useful. But the the group of people still has to come together to. Uh, align on these decisions on the on the daily sort of on the daily basis. People can tactically do whatever what they want in their roles, uh, as long as they don't break any rules. Um, and uh, but I, I think that what I learned there is also around velocity of decision making. Um, that it, a, a lot of the time, especially in a technical environment, you have to be able to make really fast decisions. And there's a tendency for all decisions to move into the governance circle. Um, for some consent or consensus-like process that ends up being really slow. It also makes these organizations, uh, we were extremely hard to negotiate with at that time because like in order to get one of these processes set up for people to, to consent, it took, it was a, a long cycle and um, someone could object at a later time. I made a, it was it, the, the negotiation side was um, uh, sort of a hidden, hidden challenge for organizations like this. Um, Another thing we learned, um, which was mostly from our partners, which was that is that swarms need stronger purpose uh, as as rules dissolve, and um, it, like the swarm style organization, uh, political organizing um, that came from the pirate party. I think part of the reason it was so effective is because they have these short term goals, very clear um, objectives, and they give a, you know, a lot of power to people organizing but the duration that they're managing tons of volunteers is actually pretty short. And so you can have this big swell of support and then it can kind of die down, kind of like um, the way that, uh, that uh, hashtags work on Twitter. It's like everybody's talking about it for you know, 12 hours and then the objective is gone. So you want your mission to be able to survive for longer, longer than that and that requires a little bit more, uh, more structure. Uh, so you'd have to have very strong, basically you'd have to have 
the most extremely strong purpose if all of your rules dissolved. Otherwise, you need some some mechanism to keep keep the engagement. That's sort of at the extremes. Um, and ultimately, like I think small agile teams perform very well. Um, you know, if they have clear budgeting, clear roles, uh, traditional agile roles, uh, project manager, the developers, um, business owner. Those, I think that actually worked really effectively. And because I had come from that and see, seen how high that could perform, I still hold a, a lot of other groups up to that, um, that standard. I should say that's, that's a great ideal. Um, and Can you I think, uh, define yeah. the si what's, what's small? Um, I would say um, for me, there's this fall off. Um, it, there's a... Uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a fall off, I think, of uh, uh, of effectiveness. I would say for me, the most effective team size is six or seven people. It's very small. Right around uh, twelve people, the the sort of like productivity per team member starts to like ramp off and and die down. And like around twenty people, you're you're in this this weird zone. I think there's this like you you need more structure on that that level, but at the I think there's this weird moment right at like 12 or 13 people where the, the sort of collective brainness of a small agile team starts to break down and they're, um, you know, because it's all person to person, it can end up being all person to person relationships mm -hmm. that the descent starts to spiral in the team and there's not, the information sharing isn't, isn't sufficient. So at the other, the other side, um, the, the other option is hyper-specified tasks. And you kind of see this on the, um, you see this at, uh, the, the other extreme is something like MTurk, where you have these, these tasks that can be picked up by anyone. They're specified so that people can go through them. This puts, uh, one, it's somewhat, um, it's somewhat de dehumanizing on the, it can be dehumanizing on the, on the worker side. Um, it also, uh, it also puts a lot of pressure on the, on project managers. So the, the project managers have to be very diligent about specifying exactly the steps that are necessary, which means that the domain has to be really well known. So for, for agile, um, I think the strength of the small agile team is that it's able to operate in, uh, situations of high uncertainty and high creativity. And another way of saying that is like, what's the task to create other tasks? Or what's the task to create tasks to create other tasks? So that, um, as the level of specification becomes more and more vague, um, these, these sort of core teams that can effectively process information together become more important. I think there's some hope that we can scale that through the set, you can call that the sense-making process. Like that's almost like uh, the sort of large scale OODA loop or something like that, observe, orient, decide, and act is, is another way that we might scale that at a larger size. But I think that um, it's still pretty hard to do that. And there's a number of components that are necessary that all have to be extremely effective in order for that to be a scalable strategy. Um, but something where it's- really, just speak, yeah. Do you mind just speaking to you know, the three or four components that need to be yeah. in place for that kind of sort of uh, agile, small teams that have some sort of loose coherence and are working towards a shared, a larger shared goal than any of those small teams could accomplish yeah. on their own, but still maintains that kind of creative yeah. spirit. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think... Um... Uh, I, I think that, like, I mean, this, my, my take on it is... That there has to be some some collective sense making process that helps to generate the um, that generates multiple cues of work uh, and let's see I know this is very specific to open team so um, I I guess I'm seeing like a mix a mix of different approaches. So some things are repeatable tasks and need to be done at scale, and those can be highly specified, um, and and they should be. I think um, on the uh, on the agile side, I do think that breaking things down into smaller queues of work um, is effective, and making sure that the top of making sure the top of the queue is highly ordered. Um, 
my experience on the on the agile side is that um, that the the project the top of the backlog, especially in a backlog that can move around a lot, becomes really critical. So I I actually for the most part do not like Kanban boards because um, they're very easy for people to see, but the problem with them is that they um, uh, when something moves from the ready state into the started state, the Kanban boards typically don't prioritize the, they don't, they change the priority. So when something moves from, from ready to started, a lot of the time the, that will now move into the top position of the started column. And then it, uh, the, it, that actually reverses the priority of the queue because it's switching the location of the board. Really, it should move to the bottom. And so most Kanban boards have that, that challenge kind of that, that issue built into them because they're not actually, they're not actually this like sequence. They're not actually functioning like a queue. So there's that issue. I think also measuring the velocity is really important um, on a continuous basis. Um, I, I actually recently just, you know, on, on the pure development side, um, the core teams that I work with are always using Pivotal Tracker because I think that it, it has all those core agile metrics in them, which are priorities always at the top, you know, who's reviewing it. You're managing these small chunks at the top. You've got the point structure. And then um, you also can see the velocity of the team and you can make projections based on the past, uh, you know, the average, the points per task that, that were done. You, you can get a, a clear, clear estimates for the future. So, I don't know. That was a really rambly answer, but I, I don't know if I have anything out of pocket. <laughs> it's like Thanks. the solution. Yep. <laughs> Hopefully there was something in there that was useful. Um, okay. So I think we're coming up right at uh, 1044. Um, I'm just going to zoom through some, some other stuff here and then we'll get to more questions. So um, one of the other things that came out of this, and you can see this in the Kamake redesign is that I think the projects are the fundamental unit of collaboration. That's, you know, you've got this high level mission and then under the mission, you have these, these projects and that's the structure of Kamake. So individual projects are more uh, controlled by a, uh, by a core team that has understanding and they can, they can bring people in to contribute. And the idea is that people flip between being contributors and being, uh, being say project owners or project leaders. Um, and that, uh, that solves for, uh, for some things the, the, this implies like a different idea of what, um, what companies could be, uh, which in a classic company, you know, have everybody is, you know, getting stock out, you've got users and there's partners, I think in this liquid team, and you guys have probably experienced this, uh, is, is that you have people moving across companies, there's different projects and people are, are both users and partners and investors. And so I think in that case, the fundamental unit is actually much smaller, which is the project rather than the company as a whole. And um, I, I think that, then that's sort of built into the, into the sort of come career philosophy. Um, yep, I'll just skip that one. <laughs> some, some terrible sketches that should be converted into some nice slides. So yeah, so uh, the next phase that we went through and you sort of seen a version of this, which is at the high level, there's missions. Um, I, and that came out of our learning that missions are, you know, are what holds the whole, holds the ecosystem together uh, and the projects kind of roll up under these, these missions. Um, then we've got awards for contributors and you saw this flow. Um, yeah, so where we're headed next is around uh, the stack idea uh, after boiling the ocean uh, a few different times. Uh, the stack now that we're working with is Kamekri is building up this token management system um, and we have some tasks, but we want those to be more like web hooks that embed into other systems like GitHub, Pivotal Tracker, um, Discourse. Uh, we also want to plug into uh, crowdfunding, which would be both equity crowdfunding and also um, more open source crowdfunding, a little bit more like um, uh, quadratic, uh, you know, uh, quadratic funding, I think is, is really great. Um, we are working on uh, providing vetting and AML KYC where that is necessary. Also, we're adding custodyless wallets. So on the token side, I think the biggest barrier to adoption so far, one of the biggest ones is just around people, you know, be your own bank is actually really hard. So you need to make it easier for people to manage their own wallets. So we're adding uh, custodyless wallets to uh, Comecri or user managed wallets to Comecri. Um, 
the partner uh, named Icon, and that will be out probably in the beginning of next year. And I think that will that kind of will change things up a bit. Um, secondary trading uh, in terms of like projects that do have equity on them, uh, or there's a token that has value that's associated with the project. We want um, uh, we're directly we want direct on ramps onto other um, onto trading systems. And then also different templates for, for projects. As we start to make sense of these things, it's like we want to be able to replicate them quickly. And then I think that's the that's going to be uh, that's going to be the moment where um, I think we're actually you know we'll shift the way we'll, we'll we'll actually be in the moment of sort of the future of organizations at that point. Um, there are some transfer restriction stuff that I'll I'll blaze by, but uh, we've got tokens for managing like you know different levels of accreditation and freezing up, uh, you know, freezing tokens for certain periods of time based on regulations and things. Um, open source, those are open source. Um, transfer group rules. I'll skip all the security token stuff. Um, and, oh, we also did a whole bunch of work on decentralized reputation. Um, we did kind of a workforce uh, decentralized reputation piece under the, the name Work Nation, which is an open source project. I think it's very similar to some of the attestation work um, that uh, that you may be doing. And what's interesting about this system was that all of the reputation was subjective. It was compiled locally to like an individual user's perspective. Uh, and then you had this your own web of trust based on who you'd worked on before. So you would get recommendations on verified project work. Um, from your own individual social network. Um, so it sort of flipped, it flipped from objective, re objective reputation to subjective re reputation, uh, which I thought was kind of neat experiment. So I'll skip that. There's an architecture for it. And yeah, I'm going to end there. I've got a bunch of other stuff I could say about the future of DAOs and such, but maybe we'll, we'll go to questions. <laughs> awesome. Noah, thanks so much. I've actually have a fairly basic question related to the open team community. Uh, I mean, some of the uh, the integrations in your stack uh, uh, resonate uh, with with us, particularly as you know, as we're we're working a lot with uh, GitLab, as you know, to uh -huh. sort of create sort of the, the, our community. Uh, artifact uh, in terms of our process and so forth. Uh, but one of the challenges that we have is, is that that consensus process requires a lot of collaborations. And as we're working with organizations that have, are, are not, we can't form a whole community around ag small agile teams. We have all sorts of structures and legacy community platforms uh, where we have a representative that may be working with a, a wide range of other community tools within their own organization. So I would just love to get your thought in terms of this uh, transition process as we improve, you know, community platforms uh, so that, you know, we're, you started with sort of a, a Slack bot, uh, but, you know, within our community of Slack and Discourse and Riot, and we're using GitLab and, and you know, Meet and all sorts of other things that our community needs to use to, to coordinate with their communities. Um, so I guess I'd love to hear your thought on this community, uh, this sort of async, you know, this, this uh, what's, the what's the proper word? Uh, um, it, essentially, if different sizes, shapes, and scales, and cultures that we're trying to, uh, to communicate uh, with. And we, we are identifying some of that consensus around some, some core values and norms and uh, identifications and, and projects. But I guess I'd just love to hear your thought on this transition period. Wow, well, yeah, that, um, I think that is, um, yeah, that's a really hard problem. <laughs> I don't want to really simplify. Well, I mean, you're taking some <laughs> some some distinct steps uh, in your stack approach right yeah. now, and and you're taking some strategic. You're making some decisions in terms of what's in your stack and what are the yep. platforms totally. that you're working for. Like yeah. Discourse seems to be and GitHub. So maybe just some some yeah. Of your thoughts so decisions. so yeah, I'll I'll, um, I'll sort of go through how I ended up boiling the ocean <laughs> and how I stepped back and tried to get a smaller piece of it to, to heat up. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you, like you've encountered, I, I think that every community has existing preferences around tools. Like um, even within a team, you know, like the designers may want one project management tool and, you know, may want Figma and, uh, and maybe Asana and, you know, the developers want to use like GitHub issues or, uh, you know, or, or, uh, or Jira or Pivotal Tracker. And, and those, those preferences are always going to vary. So I think, um, you know, across every team, I think there's a set of tools that is, I, I would say a set of functions that is common. Um, which are, uh, there's, you know, real-time chat, there's some kind of project management system, there's a wiki for organizing onboarding materials, there, uh, there is some kind of incent incentive system around, you know, that may be implicit or there may be a payment system. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the onboarding is always the hard problem and then losing docs across different systems is the is sort of the other problem. And so I think that having a hub that having a hub is probably a good a good way to go and then choosing tools that play well, well with each other beyond that. Um, so hubs and composability is kind of the, the pattern. Um, and so on the on the Comakery side what we've been doing that's what a, that sort of set of links it's just a set of links but it's really surprising how when you go into a project, you, you often can't find those things. And that um, just having a template, like here's how you onboard, here's the documentation, here's the, here's the repo, here's the chat, the specific chat channel, not like the whole group with 50 chat channels. And here's the specific chat channel exactly. where we discuss this. I think that template is the thing that helps um, even though the tools I think will remain diverse probably forever, even as they evolve. So composability and hubs is kind of my, my, uh, my rough answer. Super helpful. Thanks. Um, other, I've, I can keep asking questions, but I want to give other folks time. <laughs> I got a question for you, Noah. Um, what if, what's your how can I put this? I guess I have a bias that sometimes we over-optimize or try to create systems and processes before they're ready to do so. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it just makes more sense to do things manually before figuring out the digital transformation. Yeah. And so I'm wondering about your battle scars of what hasn't worked well or what has worked well in some of these endeavors. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree with that, and um, and we are. I have built a number of things that I, I would say we overbuilt the uh, the project management system. I wish we'd gone to um, webhooks earlier, um, but and this is because of the preferences that people have about different tools. Um, I think that Comakery around templated tasks uh, makes some sense, but I do see teams. Um, uh, trying to make sense of uh, the, the sort of generic project management that we have. Um, so I think, I think that's one area that um, I could have played it a little better. Like we're not in a terrible spot, but um, could have learned a little bit better there. Um, and then uh, I'd say that, what did we build before it was necessary? You know, actually, I think the hardest thing was this ambig ambiguity uh, for me over the last several years about how quickly the blockchain ecosystem was going to move. Like, a you know, my original interest was 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 to just build DAOs, but it turned out like it was really hard, um, and that building building the full system of like DAOs that actually have project management and can can get things done, not just fun things, uh, was really hard. And the, the, like how long it's taken the technology to develop, to develop has been really difficult. So I, you know, it's sort of back, it's sort of redundant, but the boiling the ocean thing is, is, is probably been our, um, our Achilles heel for a while. Uh, we've boiled it for long enough that I think we've solved some of the problems, but, um, and mostly just through, through learning. Um, Could I ask a kind of a yeah. follow-up 
question to that. Totally. So th this is one of the things that when I sort of look at co-makery and I try to balance sort of the kind of emergent complexity and, and project-based organization within open team, uh, yep. within region network, within the Cosmos ecosystem, wherever it is that we're sort of this intersecting, it's, it's, it's nested. There's, there's companies, <laughs> there's individual developers, there's a variety of different projects that are all kind of converging. And one of the things that's hard about think as, a, as someone who's trying to sort of like congeal and move energy, it's very hard to, to sort of systematize the project management in such a way that you can sort of like just get a template and get 20 different yep. parallel tasks and move it. And one of the ways that I've been thinking about this is more of an a request for proposal based mm. system where yep. you're, you know, kind of a little bit more open ended and people can just come and grab and, and I'm just curious yeah. if, yeah. you know, how that resonates with you and, and how you're thinking about that sort of dichotomy. Yeah. So I'd say there's like, there's kind of these uh, three different categories. One is stuff that can be templatized. Like for instance, we're spinning up a new test net and um, we have X set of steps. And I think that that is that you're building a template and there's certain things that are going to happen and maybe there's an award structure around it. I think that works really well. Um, on, that, that fits really well with the, the sort of organizational metaphor that we have in Comakery right now. There's a middle thing, which is weekly agile project management, like around software development. Things are always changing. Like I don't, I don't think it's possible to specify something for longer than a day because the whole point is as you're building it, unknown unknowns are gonna, gonna pop up and there needs to be a dialogue between the project manager and the, and the person doing the work, the person specifying the work, the person doing the work, or even if they may be the same person, but there's still gonna be some learning. Um, so I think that requires a very flexible, more open-ended project management system that's still around tasks um, but it's unknown what the exact scope of those tasks is. You get an average over time, but our individual tasks, you don't know. So that's another one. And then the last one is more around um, sort of effort tracking. And um, that, I think that also works on the, uh, on the Kamikri side as well, where it's like, hey, this is the type of work that's being done. And we're just tracking that work. And that can plug into things like, GitHub and activities on, on discourse. Um, so I think the, the one in the middle where it's core team, iterative planning, you know, the stuff that traditionally has been like a bunch of people in a room with a whiteboard and like, you know, on-site customer, all those kinds of things. I think that's very hard to, um, I, I think that's hard. That's the hardest one to do. Um, and on the sides are like, track your time, making sense of things partially asynchronously um, and uh, or highly specified sequence of events that's been done many times. Um, so those are kind of like the three three buckets of- Yeah, and I, I'm cognizant that we're sort of at the hour, but I would just sort of put it out there that I, I think that middle bucket, the one that's the hardest to <laughs> deal with on a platform is the yeah. most important and the most common yeah. and it's, I think what I'm scratching my head around is how to, um, for instance, how, how does the secretariat of open team prioritize which uh, projects or project yeah. groups are going to sort of be funded first and how does that relate to a collective process versus yeah. a centralized process and sort of it's like a meta, it's, it's less about I mean, obviously we want to support teams to do a good yeah. job of executing agile, yep. but, but that's sort of like an aside, there's really this meta question of how do we as a community prioritize what work that is sort of of the highest common good so yeah. that more teams can then access more sort of accelerate and accelerate and accelerate. So it's just yeah. a, sort and of like I'll, a cap for me, I'll, capstone I'll, for me. <laughs> yeah, I'll say this is like at the edge, at the, I think this is at the edge of all of our, all of our learning. How, what I see happening on the Comakery side is that each project also can receive funding and it's the, you know, there's a sort of a team lead that'll organize the work. It's distributed out through the, through the Comakery system as either direct transfers to people for doing work hourly or based on a task or webhooks. There's all those things are in play. Um, and then the funding for each project 
is ad administered at the project level, either as a quadratic funding mechanism or at that mission level, there's actually a DAO that's connected to the mission where there's a proposal process where individual pro uh, projects can propose up. And it could also be a combination of those two things, which is the quadratic funding at the project level and DAO proposal process maybe for bigger chunks of funding. That's kind of what's in my, in my head. <laughs> yeah, which to me, it's less the mechanics of how the funding flows, I, I think mm. is oftentimes the focus in the crypto community, which I think is right. like sort of mid to long-term important and interesting. But in the short term, for me, the question is really more about how, what level of reporting transparency is mm -hmm. necessary for intergroup coordination and, oh. and good decision-making in a way. Like, and how do we, it's sort of like circling back to Dorn's question. You have all these different tools, people have their oh, own things. Yeah. How do you kind of create some I, sort yeah. of dashboard where yeah, totally. there's, there's this collective sense making that you were referring to that can yep. happen in, in a more, in just a better way so that yeah. I know what Nori's prioritizing so that I don't reinvent the wheel and they know what I'm prioritizing and collectively right. we know what other people are working on at, at a loose level and when we need to like dive in and when we don't and these sorts of day-to-day -day questions take up an awful lot of bandwidth I think, right now. yeah i think that goes back to the other question which is related to tools um and and i th i think that one possible answer is that if you do have projects in this templatized format where you have like, oh, here's how I get to their project management. Here's, how, here's the onboarding docs. Here's the summary of what they're working on. Here's the channel where they're discussing it. Here's the history of all the transactions that have happened in the group. Here's their past funding. These are the people leading the project. This is the number of people who are interested in the project. I can see the list of those people. Since you have all of that in a templated group, a templated format, when it comes to that, that group making a proposal or the request for quadratic funding, the information is there, like the signals are there of the actual work that's being done. Yeah. And there can be some synthesis on the, on the homepage or updates that people can read through. But I think but that's- note, This is the profile question that we've been yeah. talking about, Doran. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. like, oh, how no, do no, you no, create right? the we got it. dynamic, yeah. rich, like enough template that it's standard, dynamic enough that it plugs in and it doesn't create a big administrative burden on each team, this sort of like profile approach. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really yeah, interesting. Cool, and that, and that is what the, the project landing pages are about. That's why there's the links and the templatization of the links and um, uh, the integration with different systems. Awesome. Thank you so much, Noah. It's clear that we're just getting started here. <laughs> so, cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm super grateful for your time and wisdom and just sort of taking us through the journey of the, the learnings and the iterations. And I, hopefully this is really informative for those of us in open team and, you know, and, and affiliated networks to just kind of think about how, you know, how we can learn and, and maybe how we can integrate and cooperate and um, adopt um, co-makery and how that makes sense. So thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's really, really great talking to all of you. <laughs> great. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>